Well, good morning to you again from wherever you're joining us and however you're dressed. I'm Pastor Sarah, the young adult pastor, privileged to be here with you all at Church on the Queensway. And I'd be remiss if I didn't send some warm greetings, warm love to you from my husband. Jensen says hi. He's doing amazing. And really this morning, I want to introduce the idea of partnership. Now, what has been really getting me so excited is has been worshiping with you all online these past several months. And before you think that this girl has lost her mind, I've seen your excitement just blowing up the chats and how you're just receiving from the Word of God and what these amazing speakers have been bringing these past two months. But more than the excitement, I've seen that you are people postured to receive, that there's a hunger that's building and stirring in your hearts. Praise be to God. And the truth is, especially in these times, not in spite of these times, but especially in these times where there are things, there are situations, and there are people that God has entrusted personally to each of us to reach. Now, if you're scrolling on Kijiji and you come across an ad, imagine this, you come across an ad in big block letters that read, wanted, partner for miracle. Well, dial back the clock a few thousand years to Moses' time, and Moses came across such an ad. It was a bush on fire, and God was speaking to him through it, calling him into his immediate destiny. Now, I just want to take a brief moment here to talk about, in the Greek, there are two words to describe time. The word chronos refers to measured, synchronous time, like the hours and, and things that just go steadily by, minute by minute. But Moses' encounter with the voice of the one and true God, the uncreated one, that's an example of a kairos event, when you are literally, literally presented with a moment that can be life-altering, the potential to change the course of your life and the destiny of those around you. And believe it or not, we've all been presented with kairos moments. The spirit of the living God is always attempting to arrest our attention, to draw us out of our circumstances, out of hopelessness, out of whatever we may be facing, and draw it unto him, the beautiful face of Jesus Christ. And it's all about how we partner with God, isn't it? Because in these moments, kairos moments, that can be life-altering, how we respond, like how Moses responded to the voice of the Lord in the burning bush, that changed the life of a nation, the course of a nation. And for us, that can change the lives around us. Because here's the truth. We should be on fire to bring about the will of God into this world. Through whatever you're doing, we should be on fire for that. Less prayers of, I'm just going to use me as an example. God, here are my laundry list of wants and my needs, and it would be great if you could see to them. And more of prayers like, God, what do you want from me? What do you need me to do in this situation? Well, Every detail of the Israelites' exodus out of Egypt. And I know you're all familiar with this story, and that's what we're going to look at today in Exodus 13 and 14. Every detail of their exodus from Egypt just speaks to the greatness, the absolute greatness of the one and true God. Just a quick history recap. At that point in history, Egypt was such a powerful nation that they were literally the mightiest in the ancient world. And to top it off, Pharaoh was groomed to believe he was literally and physically a supernatural being, a god on earth, like all the other pharaohs before him. So what were the Israelites up against? Well, they left their time of enslavement, believed they were free, and began to be pursued by the most elite military force at that time, and also by a guy who believed himself a god. What could go wrong here? But it wasn't the elite military force that proved a threat to God's plans, nor the man who believed himself a god. No, not even a little bit. What delayed and even challenged God's plans for victory, for success, for glory, were the hearts of his own people. And I get it. You know, the Israelites, they were caught between a rock and a hard place. But let's, let's draw the context of that. They were released from years, generations of enslavement by the Egyptians. 
and they found themselves seemingly blocked off by this huge body of water, the Red Sea, and they begin to panic. And for some of you, you may be in that situation today or a situation like that that feels just as hopeless. And here's where the difficulty lies. You are in that place where you're between a promise being made and seeing it fulfilled. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, but I know that the Spirit of God wants to move in and through you and drop some mighty revelation. So just continue to keep your heart open and be postured. God is so good. Let's read Exodus chapter 13, and I'm starting at verse 17 here. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through Philistine country, though that was shorter, For God said, if they faced war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea, and the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. And just file that away. We're going to come back to that. Starting at verse 20. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Itam on the edge of the desert. And by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. And I love verse 22. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Another nugget just to file away. And real quickly, we can pick out three really interesting observations. Number one, we are told that the Israelites left their land of enslavement, Egypt, ready for battle. They had the weapons, they had the armor, They were actually, verse 18 tells us, they were they left in battle formation. Even on their journeys, they were ready for any battle that were to come about. Second interesting observation: that even after leaving Egypt, God redirected them away from Philistine country, away from war with the Philistines. And Were the Philistines an even greater civilization than Egypt? Not even close. They were fearsome, yes. They were Goliath's people, yes. But see what God did there. He took took them on a much longer journey around this, making them avoid that even though they were armed for battle. Why wouldn't God just let them fight if they had the armor, if they were ready? But we get a glimpse of God's reasoning here in verse 17 where God says the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. See, God knew these people would tuck tail and run, even facing a lesser adversary than the Egyptians. The hint of war. And third, very quickly, God's presence personally led them in a never-before-done miracle, the cloud of Sorry, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of cloud, sorry, of fire by night. Wow. I'll admit, it personally doesn't take much for me to start complaining about the Israelites. Maybe you felt the same sentiments. Their disobedience, their carelessness litters the Old Testament. And I think to myself sometimes, won't they ever learn? They see these mighty moves of God. They see him move mightily on their behalf, but so quickly they withdraw into doubt, into disobedience. But here's where I get encouraged, because we realize that what God has done in, through, and for the Israelites is what he wants to do in, through, and for us, all believers. So just from those three observations, God's presence never left the Israelites. He went before them. He cleared the path for them, away from enemies, away from battles that they were not to fight. His presence guided them through everything. And that's what he wants to do through us, to show himself mightily through our lives. And this is where I get even more excited. Look at Exodus chapter 14, starting at verse 15. Now at this point, the Israelites had reached the Red Sea, and they just began to panic. You're all familiar with this. And this is what the Lord says. The Lord said to Moses, verse 15, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. 
As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. As for me, I am going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. We need to be prepared. The Israelites, we're told, were armed for battle. They had the armor. They were in battle formation. They made maybe new technique. But God knew that where the real battle was to take place was on the inside, that their faith, their level of faith was dismal, basically non-existent. And the truth is, we've all been in a similar position to those Israelites. We thought, well, we prayed yesterday. We're good today. It's okay if I don't really go through Devo time with the Lord. Or, oh, I met with my small group uh, last week. I'm I'm good. I'm good. I don't need to really open up my heart to God or to anyone else. I'm good. But really, we think we're prepared. But when tough times come, we can be just like the Israelites. We blame God. Now, if you've ever think that you've gotten to know all there is about God, you haven't even come close. And I'm not knocking on anyone. This goes for everyone here. We could literally spend 365 days a year in the word of God and come away every day with something fresh about the person of Jesus, about the person of the Holy Spirit and our holy, wonderful creator, Father God. We need to be spending more time at the feet of Jesus, welcoming his beautiful presence. It doesn't matter if you're in the grocery store. It doesn't matter if you're on the TDC bus or waiting for it. It doesn't matter where you are. We should have a mindset that we want to live life every day with Jesus, every day, everywhere, whatever we're doing. And I love that we get to be intimate with God, whose greatest gift to humanity was to be intimate with him in return. No holds barred, no walls. When you accept Jesus Christ, all of heaven is open to you. That's what we talked about on Wednesday night prayer. See, God wants to pour into you more than yesterday. The Bible talks about old oil, old wine, wine skins. No, God wants to pour new oil, fresh wine into you. He wants to pour more revelation, more of his Holy Spirit into you so that you don't enter today or tomorrow the same. I love how God, in his altogether great mercy, just gives us more exposure to him and the way he works in our everyday lives if we let him. He gives us more opportunities to build our faith. And this is where I'm going to go into point number two. See, we need the process. As we read, the Israelites were rerouted away. And what what happened with that on their journey? Why were they rerouted? Well, I love what God did there. He strategized. He gave them one-on-one time with him. Him doing a new miracle. Him showing them in a never-before-done thing of the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. He was building up their faith for what was to come. Now remember, these are generations of people who just came out of the ten plagues upon Egypt. They saw the hand of God move mightily. All these things, all these disasters controlled by God himself on their behalf. But even still, they started to panic at the Red Sea. And like them, I find this is just a reminder that we often whiz through our days too busy to contemplate and to just marvel, to get back into that place of awe where we say, God, look at you. Look at what you've done. You're so good. You're so mighty. Who is like you? The point is when you see something miraculous, your faith level rises. Trust the process that's happening in your life. Get into greater intimacy with God. He's preparing you for your Red Sea hardship. And if you don't know what that is, seek clarity. The Bible says we can freely approach God. Just ask Holy Spirit. Take a moment. Holy Spirit, what Red Sea hardship are you preparing me for? When they appeared to be blocked off by the Red Sea, again, the Israelites and Moses were caught between a rock and a hard place, between their promise of freedom from slavery, freedom with God, Yahweh, and seeing that promise fulfilled. And this is where we find the heart of today's message. Point number three. 
We need to partner. That's my third P. We need to partner with God. Did God need Moses' hand or staff to part the Red Sea? No, not at all. God has all the power and Moses has no power of his own to do so. But you see how God wanted to use Moses. God allowed Moses to deal with part of the issue, to part the Red Sea, while he dealt with what Moses could not, the hearts of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's men. In other words, we have a real part to play to bring in the real, supernatural, impossible moves of God through signs, wonders, miracles. And it is God who holds the battle, ultimately. It is him who deals with what we cannot, people's hearts. It, make, it makes God happy to use us in his plans, like healings. He wants to use you, your hands, your mouth, to declare and bring about healing through the person and the unmatched authority of Jesus Christ. So when God calls us to partner with him, he gives us everything we need. And this is my last point, point number four. We can only pass on what we have. That's my last P, pass on what we have. And I think there's no better example of this aside from the life and ministry of Jesus Christ than Acts chapter three, verses six to eight. Why don't you read it with me? The context of this here is that Peter and John, disciples of Jesus, were headed to the temple to pray. And alongside the temple, they passed by a lame man who had been lame from birth. And this lame man was begging for money from them. And look at what Peter replies. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand. Peter helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and the man's ankles became strong. The lame man jumped to his feet and began to walk, and he went with them into the temple courts, jumping, praising God. Now Peter and John had something far more valuable to pass on than what that lame man was initially begging for. So do we, because I love what it did, what Peter and John show us there that our faith, what we have to pass on, is not for us. Let me just say that again. Our faith is not for us to hold up and hide and keep it under some sort of bushel. But it is to grab everyone, as many people as possible, to bring into the presence of God. You, like Peter and John, can give Jesus as the hope to this world and to the ages and life to come. And here's where I'm going to get really real with you and know that I'm not picking on anyone because I myself am included in this. If you're living 50-50 with God, if you have one foot in, one foot out, you're living like a Christian, believing, thinking about God Friday to Sunday, but living another way Monday to Thursday, doing what you want, listening to what you want, watching what you want, I just want to ask you today, how is your life inspiring faith in God? And if the Bible to you is nothing more than good stories and, and the God of all gods is nothing more than a character in these stories, what are your actual expectations of God? Is he a God that can heal for you? Is he a God that can move in the impossible? And I'll tell you why that's a scary place to be. Because Satan, the kingdom of darkness, whether you believe him or this kingdom of darkness exists at all, because they believe in the word of God a thousand percent. In fact, they're trying to do everything they can, every second of every day in the spiritual realm, to prevent you from realizing your authority in Jesus Christ. Because what's the big idea? Why is your authority in Jesus Christ such a big thing? Because when you accepted Jesus, when you said yes to Jesus, Holy Spirit, the spirit of the living God himself came to dwell inside of you. We're more privileged than Moses and anyone in the Old Testament. We have the spirit of the living God ab abiding, dwelling within us, connecting us directly, unifying us to the mind and heart of the Father. And if you're a believer in Christ... You're seated with him, with Jesus Christ, in his position of authority. His body is not in a grave, friends. Surprise, surprise. He is seated in the highest place, in the highest spiritual realm, with all authority. The Bible says every authority, every kingdom, whether, throne, whether the throne is seen or unseen, was placed under his feet. 
and you are given the exact same authority. You have the spirit of the living God living inside of you to perform miracles, to show a crazy depth of love and forgiveness in situations that others may look at and say, that's impossible. You're given the spirit of Jesus Christ to point all to Jesus Christ. And I know it's great to hear all these awe-inspiring stories of the Bible, but it's altogether something different to hear what God is doing in our times and today. So I just want to share with you briefly this beautiful story that encouraged me. It's a story of a young woman who graduated from Stanford U as a doctor, but she felt in her graduating year, she felt that God was calling her to be a missionary and to serve specifically in the nation of Africa, in the continent of Africa, I should say, sorry. One day she was driving on the road and it was a long drive and on this bu- in the road in front of her there was a bus, a rickety bus, and you've seen them. They had suitcases and, and things piled high on top of the bus and just ram-packed with passengers. Now the bus in front of her began to swerve and it spun wildly out of control and passengers, unfortunately, were thrown from the bus and just littered the street, littered the area all around the road. Now this woman, she gets out of her car. She goes to survey the casualties. But she felt in her spirit that God was prompting her to pray over the victims. And she felt also specifically that she was to instruct the other motorists, all those who believed in Jesus, she told them, if you believe in Jesus Christ, I want you to kneel beside, choose a victim, choose a, a casualty, and you just declare life over them in the name of Jesus. So that's what they began to do. But this young woman in particular felt drawn to this dead person who was quite obviously dead. In fact, I'm sorry if I'm being a little graphic here. You know, you know the scene. You know car crashes. They can, they can be a little grisly. So she approaches this dead person. And she, she feels in her spirit she's to pray for this one. So she's declaring life over this dead body. A person with mangled body, limbs twisted here and there. And she's praying. She's going after it. Minutes go by. Nothing happens. And then she gets up to check on the other victims and the other casualties, seeing what she could do to sort of triage the situation. And screams just rip through the air. She turns back and she sees that that one person who was dead had come back to life. And when I say come back to life, no doubt about it, all her limbs had resumed their rightful place. Everything that was broken, misaligned, came back into place. Incredible. And when that started just spread in the camp the awareness of what had happened. Man, the miracles were coming in hot. People with serious trauma, serious bleeding, what should have been fatal casualties. Bleeding stopped. Casualties, all the sort of wounds were healed instantaneously. People who were definitely out cold, unconscious, awoke at that moment to perfect mental clarity. I just find that fantastic. And that story just spoke to me because it reminded me God wants to partner with us. God wants to use us. And like all those P's that I talked about, those four P's, it actually begins in our heart. And I just want to leave you (laughs) another letter of the alphabet, three D's to just incorporate into your daily life. You may feel like you're in this time of hopelessness where the situation doesn't look like it'll change. But can I tell you today again that God has promises upon promise for you and he is waiting for your faith level to rise to see your promises fulfilled. I can't see the word settle fit into the context of Jesus' teaching. We know that he was one heart and mind and spirit with the spirit of the living God, and with the Father God himself. And to know that he's given us his authority. He's given you his authority. The Bible clearly tells us there's nothing impossible for those who believe in Jesus, just like we sang. That was our declaration. There's nothing impossible for those who believe in a reality that does not yet exist, but through Jesus Christ. So the first D that I want to tell you to incorporate into your life 
is to declare, just like what we did. We want to declare. If you begin your morning just declaring the word of God, you're claiming that truth over yourself. The second D I want to leave with you is delight. When you wake up in the morning, just posture yourself in this posture of just thankful, thankfulness, thanksgiving. And start with just three things. I know you're probably going to go to 10, 20 things, but three things that you're thankful for. And that's how you start your day. Not with the news, not with what CNN says, not even if it's going to rain. You say, thank you, God. And your list goes on from there. And my last D is daily one-on-one timeouts with God. We all need our timeouts with God. Start with 15 minutes, if you can. Portion a, a time in the morning where you can say, God, everything about me, even though I may not feel like it, even though every circumstance in my life right now is just so depressing, you're telling him that, God, I want to honor you and I want to put you first in my life. And you can watch God just move in and change every situation around you because you're honoring him with your heart. And that's, that's just the message that I wanted to share this morning. That our approach to God should not change because he doesn't change. Because he is the faithful one. Thank you for listening and be blessed in Jesus' name. <laughs>